I'm Gareth Owen, and this is Dragon Heart. Hello and welcome to the first Dragon Heart of 2024. I am joined by just Mark Griffiths today because Mark thankfully we're, we're both off. And I'd like to say first, before anything, congratulations to both Bill and Joe on their newborn ba- baby born. Yeah, I can't get it out. Their <laughs> newborn baby, Kobe. I am a very proud uncle and everyone at Dragon Heart and Rex FC wishes them all the best, don't we, Mark? Oh, absolutely. Wonderful news. Congratulations. As I said to them on social media, I don't understand why they didn't name him Arthur, Ben, Aaron, Anthony, James, Luke, etc., etc. But, you know, we all make bad choices as parents occasionally. Fair play. And that's the official word of just Mark Griffiths, Jay. (laughs) Just Mark Griffiths. Well, (laughs) Exactly, and we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got the two games to talk about, two very opposite games, a lot to break down there. We've got the Paul Mullen and Elliot Lee contract signing, which we're going to be talking about, which every Wrexham AFC fan so over the moon about. We've got Shrewsbury, and we've got a little segment at the end, a little surprise segment at the end that Mark's got planned. So let's not waste any time. This is Dragon Heart. I'm Mia Roberts, and this is Dragon Heart. Well, four games, nine points over the Christmas period, Mark, against some really, really stiff competition. Uh, You've got to say, you've got to be really happy with that. It was such a hectic period. And, you know, we've had sickness, red cards, suspensions, all sorts, haven't we? Got to be really happy with that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the strength and depth has really come through, hasn't it? Not by rotation, but just by having cover to cover different areas. And, yeah, nine points out of 12. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have 12, obviously, but 9 out of 12, 75% of your points feels like promotion form to me. The the blip is the Warsaw game. But, you know, I mean, you'd agree, wouldn't you, Che? I think after the match, what everyone kept talking about was how, how well Warsaw played more than any deficiencies of ours. I mean, we didn't combat them as well as we could have done, mm. but Warsaw were fabulous. And the fact that, what, four days later, they went to Grimsby and, and scored six I think illustrates that we've been a bit unfortunate to hit them when they've got onto a nice run of form. Yeah, exactly. And I think if you look if you look back at that game as well, if that toes of clearance off the line, if we would have scored that and we just scored just before half time, I think we would have been looking at a really, you know, a bit of a different game in all fairness. So let's talk about the Warsaw game a little bit more mm. because We've had a lot of criticism with our away form this season, which I think is maybe a little bit unfair. Mm. But it was a tough game, wasn't it, Mark? Warsaw set out really well, played some lovely football. Are you concerned about our away form at all? Or is it is it just is it so hard to compare it against such amazing home form? I think a bit of both, if I'm totally honest. I think I mean our home form is so ludicrous, isn't it? That yeah. It's difficult to compare anything to that, really. But having said that, I mean, I, I do have a, a, a little bit of bo- concern about our away form. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not horrific. I'm just looking now. <laughs> Gosh, you know what? Um, you know, one four, drawn five, lost three is not horrific. But having said that, we played 12 games away from home and scored 11 goals. And that, that's really weird, especially when you consider we played 13 games at home and scored 41 goals. <laughs> and there is something going on there that the most we've scored this season is two away from home, and we've only done that twice. So there is something there to address, but I can't help wondering if part of it is just a, the terrific quality that we've got at home, making everything look poor by comparison. But I'm just looking down the table now. I mean, let's see, we scored 11. How many teams have scored fewer than us away from home? Gillingham have only scored eight. And oh, Doncaster scored eleven. Sutton has scored eleven. Forest Green has scored ten. So bizarrely, we're miles and away top scorers at home, with third lowest scorers away from home. Our defence away from home is excellent. We've let in thirteen. And if you look down the table again, that is the second best away defence in the whole league after Wimbledon. Wow. So 
it's it's it is peculiar. It is it's quite pe- hard to put your finger on what's actually going wrong, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, I agree. In, in my opinion, I I get. I can't think of anything because I watched the Swindon game, and in my opinion, if it wasn't for their goalkeeper who made some excellent saves, I think mm. we would have been three four up. Yeah. Do you think it's it's a luck thing, or do you think? I think. Well, I'll just say this quickly. I just quickly the accounts as well. Oh, at home as well. I mean, it just it's so different. We've got the fifth worst away home defense in the division. Now I can explain that. Because at the start of the season, we weren't quite settled, right? We let in five goals to Milton Keynes. We let in five goals to Swindon. We let in three to Crew. I don't think that now that we've settled, we would have those results. But uh, but only the only teams who've conceded more at home are, are in the bottom five. That's really bizarre, isn't it? When you think about it. Sutton have let in less home goals at home than we have. Um I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is just that we have such a remarkable relationship with the crowd at home that I really think, and I think the Barrow game sort of showed it, that even when it's not going our way, we still think we're going to win because the team believe in themselves, the fans believe in them, and there's something magical in that relationship, which which does get results. Um, But as for our failure to take chances away from home, I don't know. Uh, Mullen has been missing for a good chunk of the season and is still doing beautiful, glorious stuff. But some of that maybe penalty box sharpness is not quite there with him, mm. although that's being hypercritical um, because he is playing extremely well and he is scoring goals. He's into double figures already. Um, you know, if he's continuing to score at this rate, he'll be in the mid 20s at least this season, which I think we should remember. Um, uh, but it is. I, I think. I think teams are bolder against us, and I think that parking the bus or or going defensive is a mistake against us. I think going on the front foot and trying to get at us, ask us questions. And there have been games where teams and Accrington and Walsall, I think, are definite examples of this, where they've got on the front foot, they've pressed us really hard, and under that pressure, the players maybe haven't quite backed themselves as much as they ought to to pass their way through it and open them up. And also left themselves so open at times, leaving Mullen marked by one with the two wide centre-backs both going up together. I mean, wow, that's that's bold. But, well, we can see that they've that technique has worked against the best teams in this division because they've got great results against them. So, you know, maybe we've not quite, you know, they've sort of called our bluff a bit and said, okay, we're going at you. If you're good enough to pass it through a really good press, then okay, you'll open us up and thrash us. But if you can't, we're going to be on you. And I think that's what it is. It's, I mean, I, I know it's a daft comparison in a way, but it's a bit like, you know, Villa beating Liverpool 7-1. You know, mm. Liverpool, the, the the ultimate sort of all or nothing team who press so well and really take risks and, and get away with them because they're dominant and they got quality. But there is always the occasional time when a team that plays like that, it just won't work. It cracks. And... It goes the other way. Um, well, there was a game, Real Madrid beat Rayo Baiacano when they had Paco Jemez on their, uh, as their manager. Paco Jemez is on the back of this laptop, a sticker of him. He's a heroic manager, really all or nothing. Played an extreme version of pressing with Rayo Baiacano in that team. It was about six years ago. And they went to the Bernabeu and they lost, I think it was 10 nil. It, it was at least seven. It was a proper thrashing. And yet you felt that Rio. No, 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 I'm wrong. It was something like 10 4. It was ludicrous. Yeah, I, thought, I thought it was 7 4 that game. 7 4. Right. Yeah, um, something like but that. You always felt they were in with a shot, even though they were conceding goals because they were taking such risks, because the risks were also making them dangerous. And mm. it was, you know, I, I, we, I think Walsall did a toned down version of us on it, us, and it worked. I can't help. Yeah, and I think, as you said, I think if you look back at the Walsall game, which probably has the most talking points out of the game, all the games of the Christmas period, really. Mm. I look at Walsall, their last few results, they could really string... If they carry on playing like that, they could be in the playoffs quite quite easily if they carry on playing with that form. They were the best side I think I've seen Wrexham play this season, in all fairness, and we've just caught them at the right wrong time, I think. Yeah. If we would have played them a month or two before away from home, I think only we probably would the playoffs. Them. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then our opponents before that, Swindon, for me, 
are the opposite. They're only six points off the playoffs, Swindon. But you know, we were saying at the time that they they can defend. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. They can't defend, but at least they have Kemp and Young up front with Charlie Austin, and that's a potent trio. Well, they've just lost Kemp, Kemp and Young because they've both been pulled back by their parent teams because they were on loan. So they've lost Young, who's scoring loads of goals. Kemp, who has a case to, as the most creative player in the division, a case which I feel he should cede to Elliot Lee, but never mind. And they should be grateful that they've got managed to get 15 points from them and Sutton, I think. <laughs> because yeah. with a defence that doesn't keep goals out and an attack which now has lost its two key components... I think they're in a lot of trouble unless they're able to make some good business in January. So we played them at the wrong time, but we still beat them comfortably, I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were the much better side. I thought 1-0 flat of them, really. Mm. Their keeper made two really good saves, didn't, yeah. didn't he? Um, but they just they just didn't seem to threaten at all. Even when we went down to 10 men, Wrexham defended really, really well. And that, I think that game was then, really... though, wasn't it? They, I, I thought they had threats with ten men against ten men, but like you say, did we did really... defend well. A Conco did well too. Yeah, did they um, really? But the, they were missing simple ch- chances, though, weren't they? They did. Mm. For me, it didn't look like they were going to equalise. That was me, from me watching it from the tally as well. Well, I agree. Um, I thought they were unconvincing in the box, but they did get into good positions. Yeah, really after the sending off, which I thought was a fair decision, by the way. Quite a bit of debate and, about and, that, but. and on hindsight now, if you think about it, Mark, winning like that, you know, mm. we had illnesses. We had no Paul yeah. Mullen on the pitch. We had to play um, McLean up front. Yeah. Winning 1-0 scrappy and hard, red, red card as well for a good significant part of the game. Yeah. That's what promotion sides do, don't they? Absolutely. You Look know. at it. We've recently had four. We had four red cards this season, and we've won three of those games, I think, in Brighton saying. And we've often, well, we were losing when we had the red card against Crew. So, yeah. yeah, we show terrific resilience, don't we? I mean, this team certainly, maybe that's the point. You know, well, I don't know, no, I'm going to back down. I was going to say something and then I'm going to back down. I was going to say, again, it's that home advantage belief that pulls you through and makes you so resilient. But then the James Jones red card is away from home. And then you look at games like Mansfield. Uh, both Mansfield games, but particularly in the league, where we defend brilliantly away from home. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I just can't quite explain, except that you know Mullins maybe not quite been himself, which is no criticism of him, of course. A very obvious circumstance. He had a very serious injury. Um, I just hope, jumping forwards to Barrow, that uh, that performance by Fletcher is a sign of things to come. Because <laughs> if he's able to stay fit and put in full nineties and he and he's playing like that and what how he played was commensurate with what he's looked like as a sub, oh, we've got you know now, a bit of a player on our hands there, haven't we? Oh. We spent the last five minutes talking about uh, the festive period and we haven't mentioned the Barrow yeah. game yet, which is easily the best result out the whole lot. Mark, I, you've got to say that was a it was a quite peculiar game, wasn't it? In some regard. You know, first 45 minutes, I thought Barrow looked the better side. Mm. They defended really, really well. You know, you could tell. I thought you could tell why they are where they are in the table from watching that. Vet look very organised. Yeah. And every time they went forward, they looked reasonably threatening. But Mark, that, that 10 minutes added time was crazy, wasn't it? I've, it was mental. It was something else, wasn't it? Goodness me. I mean... <laughs> I just think, okay, how do we do that? Because you're right, I thought the game was going according to how Barrow wanted. They get the early goal, they've got a phenomenal back five, and even though they lose uh, one of them through injury, that means they bring on a player who's meh, a, a more defensive-minded perhaps, because Worrell is a really dangerous player on the flanks. And, you know, they just looked so good as a defensive unit. But that's what I said, isn't it, that, if you sit back against us, even if you're so good as, at defending, just like Barrow are, you normally would expect us to find a way. Whereas that's what Walsall did well. They kept coming at us and at us and at us, didn't allow us to dominate them in their half and work away opportunities. And then we got a player of Fletcher's quality. And I'm hoping that's what makes the difference of the away games as well, frankly. You know, he gets a chance to hit it from the edge of the box. He's putting it in the bottom corner. 
he yeah. gets a free header six yards out. Okay, that I would hope we'd normally score from, but there's no doubt he scores from it. And that, you know what I mean? That level of finishing, that level of quality. Ford puts quality into the box with the third goal. You can expect that if you put something in for him to fight for, there's a good chance there's going to be a goal. So, it, you know, he was that step up in finishing for us. And, yeah, Barrow just... I, I just finished the article for the leader, and I said the worst thing Barrow did was play against Palmer... Uh, sorry, play against Fl Fletcher and Mullen. Yeah. <laughs> that was the big mistake they made, having to play yeah. against them. For me, though... I... It's that all about that first goal, the touch on the outside. You know, it was an awkward touch for Fletcher. He brought it down, and how he managed to get a shot off of all those Barrow players in front of him and nestle it perfectly into the bottom corner. He is a player that shouldn't be playing at this level. Yeah. Yes, he is a bit. He is older. I, I, I appreciate that. But if we can keep him fit and keep him fit for 70, 80 minutes every game. Him and Mullen, it, when they're both firing together, it's going to be fr it's going to be terrifying. And you know, I just look at the the League Two table, Mark, and yes, of course, we do want to win the league. But for me, the most important thing about beating Barrow was having that bit of points advantage between mm. third and fourth. Yeah. So if the top three, us, Mansfield, and Stockport, and just fly up, fly up, mm. keep on gathering points, that's all that matters because promotion yeah. is the key thing this season, isn't it? Absolutely, I, I agree. Even though we've not gone up in the table, the table looks much nicer because, mm. of course, Stockport lost, admittedly, to Mansfield, but that means that we're only two points off the top and we're four points clear of the playoff places, and that gives us a brilliant base to build from, doesn't it? So, yeah, absolutely. And let's see what Mansfield do with their game in hand on Saturday anyway, because essentially that's what that becomes because we're playing in the Cup. But, wow, yeah, it's... um. It is terrifically exciting. I've got to say as well, you're right, that first Fletcher goal is such high quality. Um, yeah. the Technically, it's brilliant. But that third goal as well, what I love about it, if you watch it from early on, is Fletcher finds that bit of space. He works to keep the space. And then when James Chester finally comes back and cover him, you know, I mean, James Chester has played in the semi-finals of the European Championships. That yeah. guy is no mug. And I think he showed it in the games. I thought... Overall, he was excellent, Chester. But having said that, Fletcher not only can get above him, but can get above him to the extent he can even get leverage and head it downwards. And I just think, wow, he's bullying James Chester. This guy, as you say, should not be playing in our league, but thank goodness he is. Well, those headed goals are all textbook, aren't they? Mm. Down bottom corners, the keeper isn't just isn't saving them, is he, at all? And all credit to Barrow's goalkeeper because if it wasn't for him, I think we would have won seven one. Yeah, yeah. Which just says a lot about our home home form, that home advantage that we have. And if we can keep the race course of Fortress, we'll be in that top three. And you know, we've got the big sides, still got a lot of big sides to come oh, yeah. to the race course as well, haven't we? Barrow are the only team up at the top who have come to the race course. And and that's always been something I've been holding in the back of my mind that we've you know, we've done very well. We've been up at the top pretty much from the start, and yet the big teams haven't come to us. We've been to them. Stockport haven't been to us. Mansfield haven't been to us. Notts County haven't been to us. Crew have and got away with it. Avis and Wimbledon are next up. You know, th that's your top seven. So, yeah, Accrington haven't been to us either. So, you know, we've we've got a great record at home, great confidence we'll get results, and they've all got to come to us and, and try and do something against us that, that that makes me very positive and for, and for me it, that saves that that saves the away form a little bit then doesn't it yeah. if you just win at home all the time yeah. and you turn a couple of the the draws into wins and a couple of the losses into draws yeah then you are challenging for the title aren't you it's as simple as that and and for and for us as well and for me this season it's so nice to talk not to be in the national league because Top three, you're automatically promoted, aren't you? So it's it's lovely being back in League Two, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I think I'm still slightly programmed to think of we've got to get above all these teams, but we don't. Yeah. We can stay where we are. We're up. That's amazing. I'm just looking as well, and you know, although we're saying about the away form not being well, certainly not being equal to the home form, and that nobody could deny that. Having said that. To be fair, we've only lost three games away from home out of 12. And there's only two teams that have lost fewer. Mansfield lost one. 
and Wimbledon are lost too. So to be fair, we are we, we we've got a, we've got a decent away record. It's just not as spectacular as our home record, as you alluded to before. It's, yeah. I'd like to see more goals away from home. It's weird we aren't scoring more goals away from home. Just got to hope that will come. Exactly, and who knows what's going to happen in this very important month of January as well. Mm. Um, there's going to be a lot to be a lot a lot to think about, isn't there? So after this, we're going to be talking about um, Elliot Lee and Paul Mullen signing those new contracts. I'm Mike the Ref, and this is Dragon Heart. Well, first thing on New Year's Day was some amazing, an amazing notification I had on my Twitter feed that Paul Mullen and Elliot Lee have signed contract extensions, Mark. That is such huge news, isn't it? It's as big as any sort of signing we could make at this moment in time. It's immense, isn't it? Um, especially, uh, as well, I mean, the, the way it was broken at a minute past midnight since the start of the new year. I mean, was genius, and and immediately, I mean, it does make a huge difference to, in in terms of our mentality to get that huge news in that manner. You just think, wow, everything's positive. It's it, it's it's brilliant. I got to say that um, interview that they both gave after the Barrow game as well. Yeah, so often players tend to just say the obvious things, and it's fair enough. You know, they're not employed to, to talk about life. But the way they described the, the the concept of finding a place that where you that, that you love and where you are loved, and how why you know it makes no sense to want to move away from that because you've got what you want, I think was very very powerful. I think it spoke very clearly and openly to what Rob and Ryan are trying to achieve. It says a lot about what Phil Parkinson has done. It says a yeah. hell of a lot about how the fans contribute to this with their support. And quite frankly, it's something which maybe players who are mulling over a move to us might look at and think, oh, wow, okay. So these guys don't regret it. We had the recent interview as well with Stephen Fletcher where he talks about um, Ryan Reynolds calling him because that was the agenda with the interview with, I think it was TalkSport. But having said that, he does make it clear. But really, my mind had been made up already. It had already been sold to him. And he just sort of think, oh, this is such an advert for aspirational players. Come to us and continue the journey. Not you know, Look at it or dropping down a level. Look at it as a, a, a trampoline. Jump down onto it. Bounce back up higher. You know, it's great. And raise your profile abroad. Yeah. You know, which... Uh... Let's be fair, in the whole of the EFL, from Championship down to League Two, there's not many teams with an international base, and the only ones that probably do are, you know, your Leeds, you know, the teams that have just come down from the Premier League, mm. you know, Leicester, teams like that. We were at such, we were at such a unique point mm. that, that, that there has been no other takeover or no other club that has been through anything similar, is there? And everyone seems to want a part of it. And you've got to give a lot of praise, I think, to the recruitment staff, to whoever's brought in the players, because it's easy to bat to sign flash Harrys, isn't it, in this sort of situation? People who want to come for a bit of money, a bit of stardom. But Elliot Lee and Paul Mullin are grafters, aren't they? Oh. They're not they're not just excellent players who are flash uh, with a bit of skill and want a bit of money. These these two lads genuinely care about the club and its fans and the ethos and the owners. And, you know, they epitomize what it is to be a Rex AFC fan. Exactly. So that, that is beautifully put, Jay. I, I tell you what, um, I, I feel like Mullen, well, firstly, I mean, look at Mullen. Both, well, no, no. Parkinson has done an amazing job, I think, in looking at personalities as well as players, yeah. because we uh, we are looking to bring players in from higher levels. Clearly, that runs the risk of bringing in loads of big time Charlies who just want to swan about the place and say, "I'm the best player at this club. You should all worship me." And we can all name loads of examples of clubs doing that and players becoming mm -hmm. a disruptive problem. Um, but he brings in players who are dropping down a division and are absolutely loving it. And as you rightly say. Okay, we could name lots of 
star attacking players who don't like tracking back and rolling their sleeves up. If anybody tries to accuse Mullen of that, they really need their head reading because Mullen's work... I mean, Mullen, to me, seems to be motivated by scoring goals, which is fine by us, that benefits us, and not losing. And he will work his socks off. How many times do you see him chasing deep into our own half to make a tackle? I mean... You know, there's loads of star strikers would stand there on the halfway line going, oh, somebody should deal with that. He deals with it. Brilliant. And then Lee, I mean, goodness me, Lee comes in as a number 10 slash striker. Yeah. And because it doesn't work properly in our system and an adaptation doesn't work, he he totally accepts that he has to be a box-to-box -box number eight instead. Yeah. And, and it's just magnificent. He, he really... He doesn't shirk his duties going back and he's constantly up and down the pitch and he still is able, once he gets up the pitch, to then turn into that number 10. He drifts into central areas or yeah. does the old Don Vos cutting in off the left. And, you know, I mean, it's just the guy's work rate. Oh, uh, you know. it, and that's what a lot of people thought when we signed out. Oh, he's, he's just yeah. going to be a bit of a luxury player. It's been the opposite. Yeah. You know, he definitely doesn't shirk his defensive duties. The one thing I do worry about with Elliot Lee is sometimes those crazy sliding tackles that like he's going to misjudge it and it, and it won't go completely right. But this this guy, both these guys, you know, are really up for rolling up their sleeves and really putting it, putting everything on the line for the club. And I think as a fan, I think, you know, as your bog standard fan, yes, we do want to see quality football and we do get to see quality football. But we really, people want to see them try for the club. Because yeah. everyone who thinks that, you know, everyone who's a Wrexham fan thinks, if I had the ability to play football for Wrexham, I would try my absolute best. Mm. And I think that's what both Elliot Lee and Paul Mullen do. And for me as well, I think in this deal, you've got to give a lot of credit to Rob and Ryan and the club for putting their money where their mouth yeah. is. Um, and actually making the club, you know, more you know, more financially viable in the future. So if a, a big club wants to go in for Elliot Lee, Paul Mullen, they're not going to go for free transfers. They're going to go for a good wad of cash. Mm. So it, it's a it's a win-win for all parties, this deal, I gotta say. I like that as well. I mean, yeah. Hey, who knew? Because lots of people outside the club don't seem to believe this, that when Rob and Ryan keep saying they're in for the long run, they are. <laughs> I mean, obviously yeah. they are, because they want this club to keep going up and up and up. And so, they, like you say, they put their money where their mouth is and they give Lee and Mullen the, the, the extension that they've earned, to be fair, haven't they? And that maybe yeah, is yeah. a message to other players, you know, tie yourself down with us because our star players aren't going anywhere. You know, maybe it's a message to Oconquo, sign with us because they're not going anywhere. And and it's an interesting contract. I'm not, and I'm not going to be, I'm not meaning to sound critical in what I'm about to say, you know, but in the past, uh, we've had situations like Anthony Barry coming to the mm. club, signing, and then immediately saying he wants to leave Paul Carden and the stub club have stepped aside, which was the decent thing to do. But now we are protecting our assets much more carefully, aren't we, in, in that regard? And just saying, right, it, like you say, if you want a player, you're more than welcome to make a bid. You're going to have to break the bank. Because, of course, I mean, in the past, we have lost good players to free transfers, haven't we, Jay, by not being able yeah. to tie down these sort of deals? Andy Morrell, Lee Trundle, Louis Malt, uh, Carlos Edwards. Yeah. And, you know, we were just talking before off air, look, look how much Carlos Edwards went from, from Luton to yeah. Sunderland. You yeah. know, it's he went for was it one point four million? Yes, yeah, yeah. Two say? years after leaving us on a free. Yeah. And you've also got to remember that um, back in the two thousands as well. That yeah, a lot that stretches a lot more now. Mm. So it's just it, it's just so nice that as a club we don't have to worry as such. Yeah. Of course, there's going to be interest for our top players, and that's what for. You know, that's what happens in football. I'm not saying there was or there wasn't for Leo Mullin, but there definitely is going to be because they're quality players, aren't, aren't they? People are definitely going to be looking at them. Mm. But we've got, you know, the financial security to keep them. And if they if, if they do go, we are going to get be able to get a replacement for them, hopefully. You know, it's it's ah oh, it's just wonderful being a fan of this club at this moment in time, isn't it, Mark? It's such a statement, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of quality in our squad, but 
I think from a football point of view, you would look at Mullin and Lee as the marquee players, really, wouldn't you? Players yeah. who clearly, if they were in League One, would be tearing it up. Who should be playing in the Championship at least? Uh, well, yeah, Championship I think is realistic as at, at this point in time. Uh, and we just says, you know, to the rest of the teams in the, in the division, hello there. We'll probably we may well do business and bring some quality in in January, but just so you know. These guys are winning for the long haul. They're going to be hammering away at you as well for the rest of the season and beyond. It's just, a, it's all round. It's a positive message. Tells the fans to keep faith. Says the, the owners are in it for the long run. Warns off teams who are interested in them. And just just makes it clear that we're, we're in this now. Uh, seriously. To see how far we can take it. It also has the effect, of course, of boosting their value, doesn't it? Now... Yeah. I hate I hate to bring this up, Che, but I'm going to have to, aren't I? You bent my ear about Mullin going to Saudi Arabia for a good 15 minutes driving down to Walsall, <laughs> and and I tried to say it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Well, this sort of thing, we, you said, what sort of money would you accept? And I would say, if I was Wrexham, we got a bid or an inquiry from Saudi Arabia because they're going to have to pay the Saudi Arabia tax because we know they've got money. I would say, you know, if you don't offer us eight figures you can just don't bother making any sort of offer but that's the sort of thing that that long-term security gives if somebody does come in firstly the players are happy so you don't have to really worry about it but secondly you can turn around and say oh you want our player okay here's a silly number can you actually match that and then people will probably go away and cry again yeah it, it just puts us in a win-win situation yeah. doesn't it yeah no matter yeah. what happens and and that's the exciting thing, you know. If we can hold, tie down the likes of Elliot Lee, Paul Mullin, attract players like Stephen Fletcher, you know, have low knee players of the quality of a Conquo, you know, if we when we do climb up into League One, maybe not this season, maybe the season after or the season after that, <laughs> who can we attract? It's it, Wrexham is just such a exciting prospect. It's not a flash in the pan. It seriously isn't a flash in the pan. If people who think that, you know, oh, it's just the Disney money and all this rubbish that people come out with on these um, tabloid platforms, it is not a flash in the pan. I, I seriously, seriously believe that Rob and Ryan are in this for the long haul, and that's a scary proposition for everyone else in the league, I've got to say. Well, we've known that all along, haven't we? Because they've said it, and we know they're straightforwards, but other people want to believe it or not. That's their problem. They can get stressed by by us and we can just enjoy having fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We could, we, you know, it's just a lot of, I think there's a lot of jealousy with a lot of people who support every FL clubs. And fair enough, because I, I would be the same if um, we were, you know, if we were another club. But it is what it is and what's happening here is completely magnificent. Hopefully, the Sunday fixture will be magnificent. After this, we're going to be talking about Wrexham versus Shrewsbury. I'm Luke Young, and this is Dragonheart. Well, Sunday is such a huge tie, I've got to say, Mark, and I think it's the biggest one this season so far, for many reasons. It is... You know, at the first local derby we've had in a long, long time, especially against Shrewsbury. Mark, we've got we've got to be excited for this, haven't we? God, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take slight issue about it being the biggest game of the season, just because I think promotion is the biggest thing that can come out of this season. And you know, I don't want to sound awkward, but I sort of feel like it. The, the, the games like Barrow, in some ways, are more important, but. Having said that, you're dead right. Symbolically, it's just yeah. massive to, to be back playing uh, one of our big rivals again. Um, having dropped out of contention for so long is is a big, big deal. You're absolutely right. And to be fair, you've got to give a lot of credit to Shrewsbury since we've gone down. They've been a really staple League One club, haven't they? Mid-table, lower mid-table, you know you've got to give them a lot of credit and maybe they are the favourites going into this. But mm. if you look at their recent form, yes, they beat Fleetwood in their last game, but before that, they haven't won in one, two, three, four games. Yeah. 
you've got to be looking at this as a Wrexham fan as this could be a nice little booster for our waveform. Um, uh, what's that? Uh, one second. Yeah, for our to to improve our waveform. Mm. You know, if we could get put two or three against Shrewsbury, that's going to be good for the rest of the season, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think getting through is the most important thing. But yeah, I mean, they're favourites, and, and and let's yeah. be fair here because I think I've, I've heard a lot of talk about Shrewsbury not being a, a strong side. I mean, they're they're what they're thirteenth in League One, the division above us. We should show them respect. Oh, yeah, of course. Them, they have got seven home wins this season. Um, there's only what one, two, three teams that have got more home wins in League One than them. So I think we should show them proper, proper respect. They have been struggling with goals, absolutely. I mean, astonishingly away from home. Their away form is terrible. How many goals they scored in 13 away league games, Jay? How many goals? Of... Oh, ten? Three. Oh, I it's wish we were playing many in the at Notts County in the Cup. So, oh, I, w- yeah, I yeah. wish we were playing him in the race course. <laughs> Absolutely. So they scored that many at Notts County, didn't they? But that's the point. I mean, we respect Notts County. They were a similar standard to us. They put three goals past them at Meadow Lane. Mag- admittedly, they were comedy goals. Um, but still, they scored those goals. Um, we should show a lot of respect for them. But having said that, the way we're playing and the self-belief that we've got and the fact that they can't sit off us at home if they sit off us when we're level below their fans will be livid gives us i think a, a good chance to get at them create spaces and 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 score goals um and fletcher's performance alongside mullen again makes you think well he's got a whole week to recover so hopefully he'll be all right for that game well, and yeah so it's a it's a really exciting prospect massively and i mean and it, it's a big game for shrewsbury though isn't it as well because yeah you know, a lot of their fans have been complaining about their manager and things like that. Uh, they aren't in the best of form, but if they can comfortably beat us, that's a really good boost for them, isn't it? For the rest of the season, maybe they could kick on a little bit more. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And and uh, they could kick on from this because oh, any derby game gives you a boost. If they lose it, it could put real pressure on the manager because every derby loss is a blow. But I mean. I just think as well that the symbolism around it all is quite something. Our one game at their new ground was that awful 3-0 loss, which is one of the the rare occasions, because I'm not a big fan of people saying teams aren't trying. I think when people say that, often they just haven't been able to work out what's gone wrong. Uh, Generally, teams don't try, but there was a proper malfunction of that team that lost 3-0 at Shrewsbury. And... That was the season we got relegated. It was five games from the end of the season. We were probably pretty much inevitable we were going to go down anyway. But to see them surrender like that in a derby match was an embarrassment and an embarrassment which drew some of the players out to have a go at the other Wrexham players for not fighting in a derby. And then They were a decent side that season, though, weren't they, Shrewsbury? Oh, yeah, I can yeah. remember. But, but you can still try and compete, can't you? you know, we, we had games at Milton oh. Keynes who were good where we lost 4-1. But we actually, you know, we competed in that game until the quality became too much. But that Shrewsbury game was so it was awful. Luster. It was horrible. So that's our one experience there. We want to erase that. And then there's also the weird counterpoint that it was five games to go the previous season when we won there. And Michael yeah. dropped a goal, yeah. um, which was their penultimate game at Game Meadow. And we spoiled their party. And we went on to stay up. So... It's a weird sort of symmetry between those two extremes, and you sort of feel like, you know, this one's going to be the decider, is it? <laughs> are we, gonna, are we, are, are we going to get two great performances out of three there, or are we going to find that we actually struggle when we go to that new ground? It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because I think that first goal, whoever scores the first goal, first goals in a derby are always huge, aren't they? Because you know the atmosphere could really dictate what goes on. If we concede early, the Shrewsbury fans are going to be loud. If they concede early, they're going to be go- going after their own teams. It's it's, it are, it's just so exciting. And form does go out the window in a derby. It, oh, Mark, I'm just so I'm just so excited to play Shrewsbury. If we weren't going to play a top side in the third round, Shrewsbury is the one that way everyone would have wanted, I think. So it, just, you know, I'll give a brief explanation, if you can, Mark, for the for the um, 
international fans because you talk to every Wrexham fan, they're going to say the biggest game's Chester, isn't it? Really, 99% of Wrexham fans are going to say that. But if you talk to the majority of Shrewsbury fans, a lot of them say their biggest game's us. So it's 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 an, it's a big derby, isn't it? But it, mm. I I kind of feel like it could be bigger for them than it is for us. Possibly, I, I think Chester and Shrewsbury for me are our two big big. It's the traditional one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though Tramia is close and is a fierce rivalry, um, I feel yeah, I feel like Shrewsbury and Chester are our real authentic derby rivals. Um, but Chester first, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, Shrewsbury maybe haven't got as many teams totally local to them, really. Shrewsbury Walsall doesn't sound like it's that much of a, a big affair. Hereford, I suppose, a bit further south. But yeah, Wrexham is a huge game for them as well, isn't it? Um, and they've had the better of it. They've won four out of the last five. Yeah. So, you know, we owe them one. And then, of course, you said that they are uh, established as a solid League One team, yeah, but then Sam Ricketts came along, and um, uh, and so there's the spice as well of the whole Sam Ricketts affair that he, yeah. you know, he left us in very poor circumstances to go to Shrewsbury. It reflected badly on him, reflected badly on Shrewsbury. Although I think, to be fair, most of the anger directed at Ricketts, um, and so losing a manager in that manner to them, I think, has just made. Well, this is the first derby since we've played, since that happened, you know. But it just made it a little more spicy again, I think. And to be fair, the Sam Ricketts thing is a good thing to talk about because a lot of Shrewsbury fans wanted him gone yeah. uh, after a good few games, didn't they, in all fairness. And I think that was a poor decision on his part, wasn't it, to move to Shrewsbury. And he said a few things in the interviews that really got my tail up at the time, saying things like you, all you got to do is look at the attendances and things like that, you know when really, Shrewsbury were in League 1 at the time, weren't they? And they had the likes of Sunderland go in there and well, of course they're going to have bigger attendances because they are in a higher league. Well, I was able to do the maths on that one when he said it and found that if you take the away support out, because Wrexham were in the conference, we were getting, you know if we were lucky, three figure support against us. And yeah. Shrewsbury, like you said, are playing Charlton and Sunderland and Portsmouth and teams like that. And that actually, if you subtracted the away support from our attendances and theirs, even though we were two divisions lower, we were getting bigger home attendances than them, which says yeah. a hell of a lot. I mean, that is, I, I didn't expect, I, I was hoping to find that we weren't that far behind them. But to be two divisions lower and attracting more home fans to your home games, well, I mean, think again, Mr. Ricketts. Yeah. It was it it was got it got really messy that as well, didn't it? it? You know, because I think at that time a lot of Wrexham fans, including myself, thought, "Oh, we have a really good chance of going up this season." And I think if Sam Ricketts did stay, I think we would have done. I'm not so sure, but I think that all links into how he was he would made the mistake being attracted yeah. by Shrewsbury. Um, I would say our performances just dipped a little bit before then. And I wonder how, because that was his first ever season in management. I feel he should have cut his teeth properly with us and and learned. Um, Saunders had a similar start, and then it all went downhill in his mm. first season. And I think that Ricketts might have been on the verge of something like that. We can't tell. Maybe he would have turned it around. But whatever happened, he'd have come out of it a better manager than the one who went to Shrewsbury with only about twenty games under his belt. And I think I think his. His, uh, shall we say, self belief got the better of him there. Oh, I've started yeah. this well. This is easy. I mean, there was a sense at the time at Wrexham of he was sort of a bit surprised. Why don't we have Sky Sports on our boss going away, going to away matches because <laughs> we're in National League? Uh, mm. You know, and he, he was a bit maybe sniffy about certain elements of our infrastructure. Not saying he was wrong, but we were National League. Come on, you knew what you were getting into. And I think that, you know, did that play into, well, I've just come down this level. I'm immediately smashing it. Clearly, I'm of a better level. Oh, an offer from my old club? Oh, well, I'm just walking out. That may well have been. I mean, it just doesn't doesn't sit well when he should have he should have paid his dues and seen through for his own benefit a spell with us. So it doesn't sit well with me at all. And I've heard interviews where he's justified himself and it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't cut it for me. I'm afraid I rarely feel this way because I think I'm a fairly reasonable bloke. But Rick is the dirty on us, and, and it was poor. And I think he's paid the price for it because he yeah. shouldn't have done it. It was premature for his own development. 
it was a gamble that water definitely wasn't worth taking, was it? Because yeah. it, he did fail miserably at Shrewsbury, to be yeah. fair. Um, the Shrewsbury fans really didn't like him. They were singing songs about him coming back to here, didn't they? So, you know, that says all you need to know about that. But I think we've covered everything we need to cover with this Shrewsbury game. And let's be fair, Mark, we're, what we haven't mentioned is a win in that game could push us to the fourth round. And that that then we could get a Premier League side, which is what we all hope for, isn't it? You know, but we're not going to talk about that until yeah, yeah, until it, it and or if it happens. So after this, we're going to have what we're going to talk about, Mark. We're going to talk about I forgot Hollywood. We forgot of Hollywood. Course. We're going to talk yeah. about Hollywood. <laughs> I'm Steve Dale, and this is Dragon Heart. So at half time, we had a uh, Ask WXM question about who would play who in the Rex, you know, if there was a Wrexham film made. And we couldn't really think of anything at the time, but Mark has come back with a whole cast yeah. of who, who will play who. I'm ready. I'm ready to share this with you. And can I just well, say, Rob, Ryan, you know, if you need a casting director, I think when you hear this, you'll understand <laughs> I am your man. Um, because there were some brilliant suggestions by the Ars Wrexham community anyway, weren't they? Um, yeah. they, they nailed you, and I've kept their decision for you. Um, that it's, is that it's a very flattering one as well, to be fair. I must say, Conor McGregor, that's beautiful. yeah, I'd that take is. that. I was considering I'd going say. Wilson for you, chair. I'm going to be honest, but <laughs> okay, we'll, st- we'll stick with Conor McGregor. For me, <laughs> they were suggesting Anthony Hopkins, and I, I see that, I see that, you know. But I mean, surely I'm George Clooney, aren't I? See, I would have said uh, Will Farrell for you. Will Farrell, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins, you know. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> so, Anthony Hopkins would be a good one for you. He's avoiding the George Clooney thing. I do drink coffee. If that helps, I don't know. Andy, Gary Oldman, definite. Yeah. Got yeah. that gravitas. Bill, now this is the one issue I've got here, because apart from this, my casting is watertight. Um, I've not included dead people, which I did in the initial. I said Neil should be George Orwell. But I'm and I'll come back to Neil in a second. Bill, I need a time machine because I just think a younger Billy Crystal. Right. Billy Crystal. I don't know who Billy Crystal is. I don't know who Billy Crystal is. I'll have a oh, cheese, yeah. Have yeah. I'm gonna get away with that. that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure to how how happy you'd be about that, but really? Yeah, yeah. I could okay, see that. Enough. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> uh, Neil, I've had to think oh, hard. I, about I can't this. wait for this. Um, I mean, look, for me, I mean th- th- there's an obvious Tom Hanks possibility here. The only thing is, you know, I don't know, I mean, Tom Hanks sort of exudes sort of kindness and decency and you know that's the bit that troubles me him playing neil how good an actor is he you know <laughs> that is hi mean. neil if you're watching that is, that is mean <laughs> he's gonna go after you on commentary on sunday <laughs> <laughs> bring it on el burro no it's donkey el toro <laughs> <laughs> i'm the matador <laughs> um now as for Backroom staff, I think it's obvious there's only one person that could pay Rob, Ryan. Yeah. And there's only one person that could pay Ryan, and that's Rob. Rob, yeah. So I think that's yeah. definite. I think um, Jason Seagal for Humphrey. Jason Seagal? Yeah, how I met your mother and well, oh, yeah. Sarah oh, Marshall. Yeah. and uh, He has that sort of disarming so charm. I, th- I, thought, I thought you were going to say Stephen Seagal, and I thought <laughs> that was... <laughs> now that would be well Steven Seagal actually I just realised I have got one dead person cast so maybe Steven Seagal should be Sean Harvey rather than my suggestion of Donald Pleasance although I do like the idea Steven of Donald Seagal Pleasance Steven is, is Sean Harvey now that would be class that would <laughs> that would be interesting wouldn't it <laughs> try disturbing his holiday yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then Phil Parkinson I, I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting something novel here right which is, 
he's played by one person outside the changing room, but a different person in the changing room. It's a okay. bold move, but it just suggests that split personality between the, the genuinely nice man he is outside the changing room and the sweary psychopath he is within it. So outside the dressing room, I think I'm going to go obvious and say Jason Sudeikis, Ted Lasso, yeah. outside the yeah. changing room, but inside the changing room, Ray Winston. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they look completely different, but... It doesn't matter. Like... That will... That will it, it's, it's, I'm looking for a Jekyll and Hyde theme here. They look different. <laughs> you know? He transforms when he's doing his business. Not in the sense that sounded like. Buffett, I'm not. I'm definitely not hiring you to be a director of a film. No, I, I, don't I, think, I that, think this is visionary. I don't think huh? having, having two completely different actors yeah. playing one person would work. Yeah, this is this, this is far thinking. <laughs> then Toes will be played by The Rock, obviously. <laughs> yeah, Mullen. I was thinking again. Before I remembered that he's dead, I was thinking of Dick Van Dyke, but then I thought Steve Gutenberg. Yeah, he'd be quite good as Paul Mullen. I'm sure he can do a Scouse accent if Dick Van Dyke can't do a Cockney one. Yeah, Owen O'Connell will be played by Chris Pratt. Yeah, yeah. Ryan Barnes looks like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, so I'll stick with that. Yeah, <laughs> you know. um, Luke Young. For some reason, it's got to be Michael Keaton. Yeah. In a strength, you know, um, but mostly me as George as George Clooney. I mean, well, George Evans, Henry Carvel, they're both good looking fellas, aren't they? Nice, fair. nice. Yeah, I like that. That was all that was mentioned by one of the SWX but I can't quite remember <laughs> off the top of my head. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, um. Obviously, we're still waiting for the green light. It's still in development. Uh, we're looking for executive producers. So you know, will Will Ferrell, if you're thinking about this, um, you know, give me a call. Exactly. You know my number. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you be... George Clooney is you. Somewhere. I'm sorry, I can't have George Clooney as you. I just can't have it. Referee, that is so harsh. We'll say Danny DeVito. He'd be great. He'd Ooh. make a great Matt Griffiths. <laughs> Can I offer you an egg in this troubled <laughs> time? <laughs> this is, it sounds, to be fair, Mark, the cast, it sounds like the most mad film ever. It sounds like the best film ever, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah? Doesn't, with one of those Robin films Clark that you walk Ryan. out with. You see, yeah? One of the films you walk out with and, for and you think you know less about the film than when you walked in. No. <laughs> 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 That's it. I want that on the poster. <laughs> you know less about this film after you've seen it. <laughs> Oh man, this is starting to feel like this must be real. Oh, I'm going to be photoshopping oh. tonight. <laughs> Please I, do. I, I think it's a great idea. I think it'll be a blockbuster. I think it'll be innovative. Um, yeah, just just imagine it. This trailer: Rob and Ryan, played by Ryan and Rob, walk into a a dusty town in the middle of nowhere. The locals all stop what they're doing and stare up because they don't like strangers around here. <laughs> and Rob or Ryan, it would be both really, wouldn't it? Says, <laughs> We're going to clean up this town. Oh, man. And then along comes Sean Harvey and whoa. <laughs> Bootlegger played by Will Ferrell. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, oh it'll be, it's going to be amazing, isn't it? Well, if any directors or producers yeah. of. Um, Chat. really expensive blockbusters. Want to get in contact with Matt Griffiths for his idea? Mm. He is available. Yeah, most of the time. Get to me through my agent, Honest Bill Cash Payment. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> he disappeared then. I, 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 <laughs> oh I yeah, Shay, do you want to do special effects? Spe yeah, I'll do special effects. Good luck. Uh, I ah. Uh, I, I think I think this film will be fantastic. Anyway, soon this... to any cinema near you that has no <laughs> self-respect. I was going to say something then, but I best not. Um, <laughs> this has been Dragon Art. It's been a really good one. First, first one of the year, Mark, and hopefully, first of many more great shows and many more games to talk about. 
2023 was a class year when it comes to football, I, I must say. So, Mark, that's, that's been the show. I will see you at Shrewsbury. Are we looking forward to it? Are you ready? Absolutely. George Clooney is always ready. We need to find out what's the, what's the delicacy of Shrewsbury that we could maybe try. Straw? Straw. <laughs> oh, we've got some cracking... We'll have to get some cracking straw to taste at yeah. half-time. <laughs> yeah, have a whole bale at half-time, just Norway as it eagerly. We need to find the delicacy of Shrewsbury. Anyway, this has been a fantastic podcast. This has been Dragon Art. This has been Matt Griffiths and Che Long. Thank you very much. By the movie. I'm Neil Roberts, and this is Dragon Heart. 